Well, a little while back when uh, Jack, Daniel, and I had decided, um, Jack, comma, Daniel, and I <laughs> decided on a, on a theme of missions, uh, on the theme of missions and evangelism for this retreat, I was really excited. Uh, I was really excited because I remember back to my days in college and how much of an impact God made in my life, particularly in those two areas, and, and how much that changed my thinking, changed my approach to life. Uh, and, and Lord willing, will continue to still shape my life more, and and that my life would come into greater conformity with what I was learned, uh, what I learned and was challenged with in college. And so I was excited because I was hoping that this weekend would do the same for you. That this weekend would mark a point in your life where you would think differently. That there would be an area in your life that you would think differently uh, about missions and evangelism. And, and one retreat might not be able to do that, but I would hope that this weekend would kind of, would set you on a trajectory, would set you on a path to pursue a life that would, that would pursue God's mission, that would pursue God's heart of, uh, of reaching the lost, of pursuing uh, people who do not know Christ and pro- proclaiming Christ to them. Um, that I, w- I would hope that this weekend would push you to be more faithful and sharing uh, Christ with your friends and with your coworkers, uh, with your classmates. I, I would hope that this would would put you on a path to pursue radically and sacrificially sending and supporting missionaries who are going to places where they need to hear, where they they do not have the gospel and they need it. And so maybe um, what would be most helpful this morning is to do something a little bit different. Normally, uh, and what. What's been going on this weekend is you, you kind of pick a passage and walk through it. You know, that's what we normally do at Grace Church and at Grace on Campus. We pick a passage and we walk through it. But sometimes it's helpful to take a step back and look at what the big picture is of what the Bible teaches. And look at a number of verses and, and see, is there a, an overall big picture that the Bible paints? And so this, this morning I want to do that and, and look at a few different passages. Actually, a lot of different passages. And so some of them I'm going to have you turn to. You're going to have to have your fingers loose and warm and ready and your Bibles you know, opened up. Uh, and other ones, I'm just going to read verse after verse after verse after verse. And I want you to just, if you want to, you can write down the references, but you're not going to be able to turn to all of them. So I, I want to take this morning and talk about what does the Bible say is the mission of God. And, and in a sense, this could have been a good starting message, but, but Jack and Daniel were gracious and let me go last. <laughs> and, uh, and also, this is, a, this is a great way to go, go down to kind of tie everything together that we've learned about God's heart of compassion for the lost. His relentless pursuit of sinners. And even what Jack talked about last night about being sacrificial in how we live so that we can pursue the mission of God with, with a radical lifestyle. And so I hope this would kind of tie everything together and give us a clear vision as we go back from retreat. And so the question is, what does the Bible say is God's mission? And you might be thinking, well, duh. I mean, the booklet you made says pursuing the mission of God, colon, making disciples from every nation. So like, okay, the goal, the, the mission is making disciples from every nation. Yes and no. That's a simple understanding of God's mission, but there's more to it than that. And I want us to have a deeper understanding of what is God's mission. I want us to dive deeper into the mind and heart of God as he's revealed in scripture, because the more, the more we understand the mind and heart of God, the more excited and passionate we can be about pursuing God's mission with him. So this morning, real simply, I, I want to talk about some aspects of God's mission and then our mission. Just real simple, I want to talk about what is God's mission and then because of that, what is our mission? Now, I, I'm, I'm mostly going to be using the word missions, but I'm referring broadly to both missions and evangelism. And maybe it'd be good, it'd be helpful to kind of give you a, a simple, simple definition of each one. Just because it's good to have that kind of clear. They're, they're similar, but a little bit different. Uh, if I had to give you a definition of missions, I would say it's making disciples of nations or, or people groups, as sometimes people like to use that term, making disciples of nations or people groups that have not yet been reached with the gospel. They have not yet been reached with the gospel. And I think of verses like this in, in Romans 15, and I'll read this for you. Romans 15, 18 to 21 says this, and I love this. This is the heart of Paul, the missionary. Romans 15, 18 to 21, he says this, For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit. And catch this, so that from Jerusalem round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Now pause there. He says he's fully preached the gospel of Christ 
but not every person from Jerusalem to Illyricum was saved. What he means is he has been faithful to preach and to preach and to preach and to plant churches where the churches would have believers who would go out and continue the, the, the work of, of the gospel. And so he said, I have fully preached that he's established churches that are self-replicating, that, that, that make more disciples on their own. So he's, I, he says, I fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem to Illyricum. And then verse 19, or verse 20, he says, and thus, and thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. That's, that's the, the idea of mission, that you preach the gospel to those who have never heard. You know, Matthew 24, 14 says this. This is where the missions ties in with the idea of the Great Commission. Matthew 24, 14 says this. This, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. When will Christ come? When, when the gospel has gone to everyone. When the gospel has gone to every group of people, there's no nation, no, no tribal group that has not been reached with the gospel. And so that's the idea of missions. It's not just, well, hey, missions is your neighbor across the street. I appreciate that sentiment, but that's not missions. It just, it, it just isn't. It's reaching people who have never been reached with the gospel. People groups, not just individuals, but, but, but a nation, a, a tribe, a, a, a tongue, a people. That's, that's missions. Evangelism is similar. It's missions is making disciples of all nations, of nations that have not yet heard the gospel. Evangelism is making disciples within your own nation, within your own people group, within your own context. Evangelism is making disciples within your own nation, your own people group, or your own context. And, and a verse that I think of for that would be, you know, First Peter three fifteen. That's that's kind of the apologetics verse that people use, but also a very evangelistic verse as well. First Peter three fifteen says this. But sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. If, if people are asking you, give them an answer. And people who are asking you are, are going to be the people that you are going to class with, going to school with, that you're, that you're working with, that you see every week at Starbucks when you go to the same place and see the same barista, right? Mm-hmm. What makes you different? Why are you different than everybody else? You know, Daniel and I were just talking last night, and he was saying how when he's talking to a bunch of non-believers, it's just like a, a constant struggle to get their own words in and tell a story about themselves, right? When you talk with a lot of non-believers, like, well, hey, guess what? One time I did this and this and this and this. Oh, oh, well, actually, I did something really similar. I did this and I did that. And when you go with non-believers, when you hang out with them, that's often what the conversation is like, right? But when you're there, what, what makes you different? What makes you different? Evangelism is, is just living your life and, and the relationships God gives you, the, the contacts God gives you, you, you share the gospel faithfully within your own context. Missions and evangelism, very similar. It's making disciples, but in different contexts. Both are absolutely essential and they're related, but they're different. So I'll usually use the word missions this morning, but I, I'm talking about both. I'm talking about both. And I want us to have an excitement for both because it, you can't be excited about one and not the other. That's just crazy. I only care about my neighbor across the street, but the guy in Africa who's never heard the gospel, the guy in Asia who's never heard the gospel, I don't care. That's, that doesn't make sense. It's inconsistent. Or, or I care about you know, the, the people in, in that faraway land who've never heard, but my own neighbor, I will not go meet them and share the gospel with them. That's inconsistent. And I know sometimes it's, it's easier to care about something far away, someone far away than the person right next to you because it's, it's awkward. It's hard. It's not comfortable, Right? But, but we need to be passionate about both because God is passionate about both. So, okay, what is God's mission and then what is our mission? What is God's mission and then what is our mission? So God's mission, God's mission. First, what is God's mission? In one sense, it is making disciples of all the nations. But, but why? Why is that God's mission? Why is one of those questions that uh, can be really annoying, right? Whenever I... Uh, Baij is really good at asking, not not annoyingly. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, she's really good at asking me why questions. Because, you know, I, I'm in seminary, so I'll tell her, like, oh, well, the Bible says this. Well, why does it say that? I don't know. It just says it, all right? Can you just leave me alone? 
But the question, of, uh, the question of why can drive you crazy. It can, be, it can be annoying, right? Why are you going to college? Well, I want to get a good job. Well, why do you want to get a good job? Well, because then I can make a lot of money. Well, why do you want to make a lot of money? Well, because I can send my kids to college. Well, why do you want your kids to go to college? <laughs> so they, can, they can get a good job, too. I don't know. <laughs> but, but asking the question why can be extremely helpful. Extremely helpful because... When you become a new Christian, someone tells you, hey, you should do this as a new Christian. Okay, great. But as you mature, you ought to understand why. So much of maturity is understanding why you do what you do. Why do you do what you do? And so, so, so God's mission, yes, is to make disciples of all the nations. But why? Why? And to help me answer that question, I, I want to read a quote from, from this book. And it's not the Bible, but it's a book called... Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper. And, and if there's one book that has rocked my world more than any other, as much as any other, it's, it's this book. I, I read this in college, and I, I, I highly, highly, highly commend, recommend you read this. Chapter 1 is just talking about what is missions, the, the supremacy of, of God and missions in worship. And then chapter 2 talks about uh, prayer and missions. Chapter 3 talks about suffering and missions. Changed my life. And, and, and I hope it would continue to change my life. It hasn't changed my life as much as it ought to. Uh, because, and it's helpful, not because John Piper is the man, though he, he's the man. Uh, it's because he, he understands, has meditated upon this question of why missions. Any book that's written by anybody outside of Scripture is only helpful insofar as it helps you understand Scripture. And I think that this book does. And so that's why I highly recommend this to you. If you're interested in this Topic of mission. So, okay, why is God passionate about making disciples? Why? Why is He passionate about missions? Let me read. This is this is how the book starts. So good. This is a book about missions. First sentence. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Let me say that again. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and the goal of missions. I read that and I was like, mind blown. (laughs) Who writes a book on missions and says, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church, first sentence. But as you understand, it's true. Missions is not ultimate because God is ultimate, not man. The idea that there are millions of people made in the image of God, made to know God and do not know Him, do not worship Him, is the reason why missions exist. Because God deserves their worship. God deserves their praise. God deserves their love. God deserves their faith. And so missions exist for that reason. He includes a quote from, from John Stott, another, another pastor who... Uh, wrote about missions and he said this the the highest of missionary motives is neither obedience to the great commission important as that is nor love for sinners who are alienated and perishing strong as that incentive is but rather zeal burning and passionate zeal for the glory of Jesus Christ Okay, these are the words of men. That's John Piper. That's John Stott. I want to name my kid John, by the way. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll we'll have to talk about that later. (laughs) Maybe not. These are the words of men, but are they true? Are are they what the Bible teaches? And and the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Ultimately, if if you want to ask, why does God do anything that he does? It is for the glory of God. Why does God do anything? It is for his own glory. Remember 1 Corinthians 10.31? You guys know that verse? Whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, right? 
Would it make sense for God to command this and not follow it himself? God is not a hypocrite. God also does everything to the glory of God. We're we're commanded to worship and glorify God. And if we worship and glorify something else, we are idolaters, right? We're committing idolatry. Is God an idolater? No. He also glorifies and worships himself. That sounds a little funny to say, but he, he, he does what he does to bring himself glory. That's what it means to be God. It's weird for us to say because we're man. It's not about us. But the universe is about God. The truth that, that God loves himself and God glorifies himself is, is maybe one of the most surprising truths in Scripture. It's, it's surprising, but yet it makes sense. And, and I'm just going to tell you, I mean, this morning I'm ripping off a ton of stuff from Piper. So if you read the book and you're like, dude, that's everything Tranway said. Yeah, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> but, but Piper said this. He said, this truth that God, that God's ultimate aim is to glorify himself and that God's greatest love is himself. Th- this truth is like, a, th- this truth hits people like a truck filled with unknown fruit. If you survive the impact, you find that it might be one of the most luscious fruits you've ever eaten. But you got to survive the impact. I mean, uh, this was a surprising thought to me, but but it's what the Bible teaches. God is passionate about missions because he's passionate about his own glory. The entire universe exists for him. That's why there are stars and galaxies that, that no human eye has ever seen, but he sees and he knows because it's for his glory. Let me just run through a bunch of verses for you. You won't have time to turn to them, uh, but if you want, you can write down just the reference. And the first one, though, the most clear is one that I do want you to turn to. So look at Isaiah chapter 48. Old Testament, uh, after Psalms, before Jeremiah. Isaiah 49, verses 9 to 11. Sorry, 48, rather. 48, 9 to 11. God says this, For the sake of my name I delay my wrath, and for my praise I restrain it for you, in order not to cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake I will act, for how can my name be profaned? And my glory I will not give to another. Do you hear that? For my own sake, for my own sake, I will not give my glory to another. This this flies in the face of what man wants to say these days. Even even much of Christianity today wants to make the whole Bible about me, about man, not about God. When we meet together for church, well, is this comfortable? Do I like this song? Is this seat too hard, too soft? That's That's not what it's about. It's about coming and worshiping God. Everything is God. Focus. And let me read you some more verses. And I'm not even going to turn around and turn to all the verses because Piper lists them all here. And I'm going to read them here. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm only going to like read a third of them. He's got pages of them where he just pulls out verses that talk about God's glory. God spared Israel in the wilderness for the glory of his name. Look at or listen to Ezekiel 20:14. I acted for the sake of my name that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. 1 Samuel 12 verses 20 and 22. Do not be afraid you have done all this evil yet turn, do not turn aside from following the Lord for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Ezekiel 36, verses 22 to 23. Thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, and the nations will know that I am the Lord. Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Psalm 25, 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. 
Acts 12, 23, speaking of Herod, when he was struck dead, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. Habakkuk 2, 14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Romans eleven thirty six. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. If you've ever wondered why, why hell is so long and sin is so bad, it's, it's because God is so glorious. To not give him the glory he deserves is an infinite sin. That's why there's punishment as there is. So again, missions, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. So God's mission... Making disciples, yes, but why? Because when you go deeper, it's because God's mission is, is to glorify himself. God's mission is his own glory. And that's what it means for him to be God. It would be wrong for him to glorify, pursue, love more than himself, anything else. That's what it means to be God. And, and, and how does he pursue his glory? How does he pursue his own glory? And... And this is, this is how I would say it. But by showing mercy through Christ's sacrificial death. God pursues his own glory by showing mercy through Christ's sacrificial death. He, he demonstrates his glory. He pursues his own glory in a number of ways. But this is one way in particular that, that is applicable to missions. God pursues his own glory by showing mercy through Christ's sacrificial death. Turn with me to a few passages. Turn to Romans in the New Testament. Romans 15, 8 to 9. Romans 15, 8 to 9. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. And why else? And for the Gentiles to glorify God. Why? For His mercy. As is written, Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. Again, he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with His people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise Him. Uh, the, one of the goals of God is that Gentiles, that's you and me, anybody who's not a Jew, that we would glorify God. Why? For His mercy. For His mercy. And turn to the right a few books to Ephesians. That's where we've been uh, at GOC. And last year we talked about chapter 2. And I want to bring out something again that we looked at last year. Chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Pause right there. We were dead in our sins. God raised us according to his great mercy. He raised us up with him, seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. And verse 7 says the reason. The reason, the purpose, the goal for this. Verse 7 says, so that, why did he save us? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us. In Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he would show the, the, the surpassing riches of his, of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that after this life is over, we're in heaven and, and we're, we're no longer sinners. We're, we are saved by grace and we are perfected by grace. We will never sin again. And we are, we're going to be trophies of his grace. We're going to be trophies of his grace. The angels... Who, who are in heaven now, it says in 1 Peter 1 that they, 
they long to look into these things, into the gospel, because they don't get it. They don't know what it means to be forgiven. But when they see us, sinners who have been redeemed by the grace and the kindness of God, they're going to look at us and not say, well, how great are you? They're going to say, how great is our God who redeemed you and saved you by his grace? And so you and me, we are, we are living trophies of God's grace. Christ's death on the cross was to glorify God. That's why I say it's, God's uh, mission is, is to pursue his own glory by showing mercy through Christ's sacrificial death because Christ's uh, death on the cross was to glorify God. Look at the Gospel of John. Turn to the left a few books. John chapter 12. If you look at the book of John, there's times when they say, Jesus, do this. Jesus, do this. Jesus, go here. Jesus, go there. And, and he says, no, for my hour has not yet come. No, for my hour has not yet come. No, for my hour has not yet come. And then look at John chapter 12. Look at verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. And these came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and began to ask him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew and Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And look at this, verses 27 and 28. Jesus says, now my soul, he's contemplating his death. He's at the end of his ministry. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Christ saw his cross coming. He said, Father, I'm troubled. What shall I say? Save me from this hour. No, but for this purpose I came. Father, glorify your name. Look at chapter 17 of John. This is, this is in the upper room, the night he was betrayed. And he, he prays this prayer before the disciples. They can listen in on, on Christ's communion with the Father. And Jesus says this in John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these things and lifting his eyes to heaven, he said... Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Why? That the Son may glorify you. The cross was not a moment of sadness, though in some sense it's legitimate to be sad because on the cross Christ died for our sins. But in another sense, that was a moment of victory, of great glory and victory for Christ and for the gospel. Christ said, glorify your name. For this purpose I came. But also God is not just glorified by saving generic sinners. He is particularly glorified by saving all kinds of people. Individuals from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. Revelation 5.9 says, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In heaven, the, the scene is that you're gathered around and there's people from every single tribe, tongue, people, nation, everyone gathered together worshiping Christ. Isaiah 40. 8, verse 6, you don't need to turn there, but this is just an amazing verse because you know that Jesus came as the Messiah uh, for, the Je- uh, for the Jews first. He came as the Messiah to the Jews first. But Isaiah 49, verse 6, Isaiah 49, verse 6, 6 says this, He, God, says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. It's too small a thing for you. This is God talking about Jesus. It is too small a thing for you to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Christ as a Savior is too great to just be the Savior of the Jews. He is too great to just be the Savior of of Americans, of of GOC, of of Grace Community Church, of of Los Angeles. He, He is... Too great to be limited. He must be the Savior of all the nations. 
So God is, 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 is pursuing passionately His own glory. And He's doing that by demonstrating, showing His mercy. How in the sacrificial death of Christ. Why? To save people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's the mission of God. So to just stop it, he, he's, he's making disciples of all nations. That's His goal. That's His mission. Yes, that's true. But to, to, to understand more deeply, it is because God is God. God is God, and He deserves the praise of every single soul that has ever lived. And that is why missions exist, and that is why worship, uh, evangelism exists. To save people from, from all walks of life, and, and it's just like a, an orchestra, right? You've, in an orchestra, you've got the winds, you've got the strings, you've got... I'm going to sound dumb now because I know Laura's sitting right there and Aaron, but that's all right. You've got all these different instruments, and they sound different. That, that's as far as my musical skills go. <laughs> they sound different, but when they play together, it creates this beautiful, rich music. It's more rich than just having a bunch of violins play. It's more rich than just having, than just having a bunch of uh, cellos or violas or, or anything else. You have all of them playing together with different, with different harmonies, different, different melodies, weaving together together to play this beautiful, rich music. And so when, when, when the throne of Christ is surrounded by people from every tribe, tongue, and nation singing and praising Him, Christ is glorified. He's glorified. So the ultimate reason why we want sinners, rebellious sinners to be saved is, is, is not so that they would escape hell, but so that they would, would, in experiencing God's mercy, they would glorify God and give Him the glory that He deserves. That is why missions and evangelism exist. Our heart's cry is, God, you deserve to be worshipped by every single soul in the universe. But these people do not worship you. They do not know you. Open their eyes so that they would see you and know you and glorify you. Send someone to go and tell them the glories of Christ. So to sum it all up, I, I, I think this is a helpful, succinct way of saying it. God pursues His own glory by showing mercy through Christ's sacrificial death and saving people from every nation. God pursues His own glory by showing mercy through Christ's sacrificial death and saving people from every nation. And and praise God that He desires His own glory because it is in His pursuit of His own glory that He shows mercy. It is in His love for His own name that He then saves people like you and me. It's not just selfish of God. It is because He loves His own glory, which is the meaning of being God, that He would save anyone. So yes, God is passionate about missions because He is compassionate towards the lost. But that compassion is because of His passion for His own glory. And so ultimately and most importantly, God is passionate about missions because God is passionate about God. Now, I hope some of you are still alive after that fruit truck hit you. But I think if you were to dwell on that, you would see that's the most luscious fruit you've ever eaten. That God is not about you. He, God is about himself. And in being for himself, he has saved you and loves you and shows mercy to you. That's God's mission. Now, what is our mission? What is our mission? If that's God's mission, then then that should be ours also. You and I must pursue God's glory by declaring His mercy through Christ's sacrificial death to save people from every nation. We want to be those who are pursuing passionately God's glory. And not just uh, by feeding the poor, though that's good. Not just by... You know, teaching people to read, that's good. Not just by all those kinds of social things, those are good. But ultimately, we want to be pursuing God's glory by, by, by declaring His mercy. And not just His general mercy, but His mercy in Christ, in Christ's death on the cross. And not just to, to, to declare that generically, but to declare that to all peoples of the whole world. That's our mission. God's mission is our mission. Why are you here? Why didn't God just take you to heaven when he saved you? You prayed the prayer. You were saved. And why didn't he just go, boop, like Star Trek? Why? It's, it's because he, well, there, there's work to be done here. Sure, pursue sanctification. Sure, you know, build up the body of Christ here. But, 
But once you get to heaven, you'll be, you'll be perfect anyway. You're going to stop sinning anyway. Why are you still here? It's so that you can fulfill the Great Commission. So you can, by God's grace, you can proclaim Christ's mercy, God's mercy. The reason he has left you here on earth is so that you can pursue his mission with him. Now let me explain something to you. God does not need you. God does not need you. And maybe you're thinking, well then shoo, why am I doing anything? I can just go home and eat chips all day. Well, no. Well, let me explain to you. God does not need you. Why? Because God is absolutely sovereign. He's not this helpless, sad God up in heaven put a Craigslist ad online, hey, someone believe in me, please, and just kind of like wringing his hands, I hope someone responds, I hope someone responds. That is not our God. That is not our God. Our God reigns on high. Our God is sovereign. Our God is, is on a rescue mission, coming in and invading lives and taking them out of the bondage of sin. He is a sovereign God. He does not need you. He can do it on his own. He does not need you. He's, he can rescue people by his own power. But God desires to involve you. He doesn't need you, but He desires to involve you. Why? Because it is in, in pursuing God's mission that you will have the most joy here on earth. And, and it's by pursuing God's mission that you will have the most joy in heaven. You, you are not needed, but He gives you the privilege of being involved so that you would have, you would have great joy here and you have everlasting joy there does not need you, but you get to be involved. God's going to finish the work. He's going to finish the work, but you want to be on the winning team. You want to you have participated on that winning side. If you've ever been a part of someone coming to faith, you know the joy and the excitement that's involved in that. Luke 15.10 says, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You want to be involved in that joy. So what should you do? You want to be involved in pursuing the mission of God. What should you do? Here's just a, a, few, a few practical ideas. Some, a few practical challenges. First one is to be a faithful sender for missions. Be a faithful sender for missions. Let me explain that. Again, our friend John Piper. My best friend and yours. <laughs> There are, there are three possibilities with the Great Commission. You can go, you can send, or you can be disobedient. There are three possibilities with the Great Commission. You can go, you can send, or you can be disobedient. Now just by numbers, I, mean, I would love for all of you to be goers, all of us to be goers, but that's just not how it works and that's not how God created the body. Not everyone's meant to go. And so most of you will probably fall in this category of either being senders or being disobedient. And my call to you is to be a faithful sender of missions. You know, sometimes we have this mentality, well, that person over there is called into full-time ministry. That person over there is called to be a missionary or a pastor. But not me. I'm not called in that way, so I can just do whatever I want. My life is not that way. They were called to be radical, to be sacrificial, to go and pour out their lives for the gospel. They were called to that, but I'm not called to that, so therefore I can live and do whatever I want. The reality is, if they were called to go, and you're not called to go, then you're called to send. You're either called to go or you're called to send. It's not, well, they need to go be radical and sacrificial and give up their lives for the glory of Christ and for the gospel's sake. No, if you're not called to go, then you are called to live in a way to make that possible. You are called with the same amount of faithfulness and the same amount of sacrifice to make that possible. And so what does that mean? It means that you give sacrificially. And Jack talked about this yesterday. And again... One of the things that was so helpful about, uh, about Piper for me in college, and you, know, you, know, you don't want to, it's always good to, to have kind of balance to your thinking, but one of the things that he, he stresses so well is that the Christian life is a war. Christian life is a war. It's spiritual warfare. 
And he says, in, in war, in war, you have a wartime mentality and a wartime lifestyle. You don't live lavishly and luxuriously. You live on what you have to so you can give to the war front effort. And in his chapter on prayer in this book, Let the Nations Be Glad, he, it's so helpful because he says prayer doesn't work in America. Do you, do you want to know why? It's because we misuse prayer. We use it as an intercom to call upstairs for more soda and chips. He says prayer doesn't work that way. Prayer is a, is a walkie-talkie that you use on the battlefield to call in for reinforcements. That's what prayer is. That's why prayer doesn't work in America. We're, we're praying for the wrong things. Prayer is a, is a walkie-talkie to call in for reinforcements on the battlefield. So, so as, a, as, a, as a sender, you, you give sacrificially, understanding there's a war front effort, and you pray, you pray at understanding it's a walkie-talkie that calls up to reinforcements that send in the, the power of God through the gospel. And praying consistently, let's just admit it, it's hard, right? It's hard to pray consistently for those who are out of sight, out of mind. But, but it's a discipline that I want to grow in, and it's a discipline that I want us to grow in. And, and that's why, as a Bible study, Mallory kind of mentioned this earlier, we're, we had those, those prayer cards, the, uh, the Christmas in September, for a few families, the, the missionary family, the Andresens in Germany, the, the Williams and the Browns in India. And then we also had some cards for the Beta Box in Malawi. And the reason why we, we're doing that one is because uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine named Jim, he, he serves at the UCLA Bible study. I've known him for a long time. And he's, he's going this December to Malawi with his whole family. And they're going there to, to help Brian Biedebach started a seminary there to train pastors so that they would pursue the glory of God in Malawi and proclaim Christ. And, and so he's going in December. And I said, Jim, can you come to USC GOC and just share with our students what you're doing and give them a vision. Get, just, just give them a glimpse of what you're doing and share with them that excitement so that we can pray for you. So we would meet you before you go and we can pray for you and get updates from you. And as a Bible study, in a sense, just kind of support them that he would be he would be one of our missions. We'd pray for him and get updates on how they're doing. And so you want to be here in October. That's going to be later in October. Jim's going to come. He's going to give this presentation. And it's going to be awesome. And so be a faithful sender for missions. In college now, I understand. I mean, some of you guys are not working. You guys are just collecting loans, you know. So, but, but, but one day when, when you are able to, that you would give sacrificially. You would give to the glory of Christ in missions. And even, I can't remember if it was Jack or Daniel saying, or both of them said it, but, but if you have the mentality of someday, then it's never going to come. You know, I remember when I, my first job as a, as a janitor at my church back in Sacramento, I loved it. It's one of my favorite jobs. And uh, my friend told me, um, you know, as a janitor, I was making like small bucks, you know, not big bucks, small bucks. But he said to me, you know, it's really good when you start working, even part-time, a few hours, making minimum wage to get in the habit of starting to give. Because if you say to yourself, well, I'll give when I make more, you won't. And, and that was so helpful. That was so helpful. So don't, don't, um, don't take your school loans and give. That's probably not wise or right. I think that might be illegal. But if you're working, <laughs> if you have some income, even as little as you can, Make that something you start now so that you're building that habit, building that mindset, building that, that heart reflex of wanting to give towards the cause of Christ. What else? I would say go on a short-term mission trip. This summer, Andy went. This summer, uh, Daniel went. And, and I would, oh, and Isaac went. Yeah, there we go. But I would love for more of us to go on a short-term mission trip in the summer. Because... If you've never done something like this before, you really need to try it once. You're, you're not going to have summers for the rest of your life. College summers are a rare thing. I don't know if you know that. Uh, you know, you've had them your whole life so far, but one day they're going away. <laughs> Use your summer well. Use your summers well. Our church sends a bunch of short-term mission trips all over the place, different times of the year, different countries, uh, different emphasis. So you can kind of pick and choose, and you can go... Try one, and, and, and the thing is, it's going to give you a bigger vision for the glory of God. It's going to give you a bigger vision for the church. It's going to give you a bigger vision for the gospel, because you're going to understand, well, it's not just people here that believe in God. Oh, and Gary went too, on a short-term mission trip. Sorry. Saw you. 
<laughs> and, and the thing is, going on a short-term mission trip will open your eyes to, to have a more global view, but it will also help you be a better sender. You'll better understand the difficulties of, of what it means to be a missionary. It'll help you to better know the people that you're going to be praying for. I mean, the coolest thing is to, to go on a short-term mission trip and then, and then just start praying for that missionary that you met regularly. What else can you do? You can be a faithful evangelist. You can be a faithful evangelist. Again, it's inconsistent to say, I want to send all my money to the, to the, to the frontier of missions and not have a heart for your neighbor. And I say that with great uh, uh, contrition in my heart, own heart, knowing that I need to grow in this. I need to grow in this. It's so much easier for me to stand up here and preach the gospel to you here or on a Thursday night than it is for me to, to, to talk to the barista a little bit longer at Starbucks than, than, it, than I need to. But GSC, let's be faithful evangelists. And, and evangelism is not an event. It's not an event. We, we do different things for evangelism. We do like a worship and testimony night, but evangelism is not an event. We, we do campus evangelism on every other Friday, but evangelism must be more than an event. It, it must be a lifestyle. It must be something that you just live, eat, breathe, that, that when you have opportunity, you'd be looking and, and making the most of those opportunities. Evangelism is not just inviting someone to Bible study. Evangelism is not just inviting someone to church. Inviting someone to Bible study and inviting someone to church is great. It's a great follow-up to the conversation you've already had with them. Evangelism is sharing with someone the gospel, the good news of Christ, the, the fact that we are sinners worthy and deserving of hell, but God in His love sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place to take our punishment. If you don't get to the cross, you have not shared the gospel, by the way. That Christ died on the cross, taking our sin, taking our punishment, and that Christ on the third day rose again. That He rose again, showing His victory over death. That's what evangelism is. And evangelism is hard. You know, if you think, well, evangelism is just hard for me, like, you know, that guy over there, he's really good at evangelism, so I'll just let him do it. It's hard for everybody. It's hard for 99.9% of people. And that one person it's easy for is just kind of a little odd. And that's fine. And you, you thank the Lord for them. But, but, but it's hard for everybody. It's hard for everybody. And so don't let that hold you back. It's not just going on campus, meeting someone random. It's not just inviting someone to some event. It's not saying hi to a new visitor at church. It includes those things, but it's talking with your, with your roommates that are not believers, talking with your classmates, talking with uh, your coworkers. It's those kinds of things. It's building relationships with an eye for gospel opportunities. And obviously, you don't have to force the issue every time. Every single person you meet, it's like, boom, you've got to share the gospel. Otherwise, like you have just condemned them to hell. I, I, I think that's a little bit maybe too, uh, too legalistically zealous, but, but that you would look for opportunities and that you would always have a desire in the back of your mind, man, I wish, I wonder if I could turn this gospel conversation, this conversation to the gospel. Pray for gospel opportunities. Pray for gospel opportunities. Why should we pray for gospel opportunities? Because, number one, God answers that prayer. God, give me opportunities for the gospel. Open some doors for the gospel. God answers those prayers. Why else? Because praying for opportunities grows your passion for evangelism. It's hard to pray for something without your heart growing in that area. I mean, just kind of a small hint. If, you, if someone gets on your nerves, you pray for them and you learn to love them. And so if you struggle with evangelism, pray for opportunities for evangelism and then your heart will grow in that direction. And also because praying for gospel opportunities will open your eyes to the opportunities that you always had but never saw. How else can you be a faithful evangelist? This one's real practical. Meet new visitors at GOC. Meet the new visitors at GOC. Make it a point that if there's a new person, you're going to go say hi to them. And they're not going to leave until you have said hi to them and like been really cheesy and loved them. You don't have to be cheesy. That's just me. That's my, that's my tactic. <laughs> Meet new visitors at GOC and, and love them. And, and you know what? A lot of people are going to come visit. Some of them are going to be believers. But you know what? I mean, if, if you've been a Christian for a while, you know that not everyone who says they're a Christian is. 
And so follow up with new visitors. Meet someone and then say, hey, you know, let's go, let's go grab coffee sometime. Let's go grab lunch sometime. Hey, can I, let's hang out sometime. Get their email address. Get their phone number. I mean, we don't have a, a, an official follow-up team right now. And I would love it if we didn't need one. And all of you just, you know, every new person that came, five people were bugging them to, to hang out that next week. I mean, I would love that. I would love that. Be faithful in the opportunities God gives us. I mean, that's just the easiest one. You don't have to go find them. They come to you. They, they said, hey, I'm coming. I'm kind of interested in the Bible. By them being there, that's what they're saying. All you have to do is just kind of follow up. Just follow up. And some of you are great at that. Some of you are great at that. I, I'm just so thankful for you. And I just want to encourage all of you, excel still more. So you want to be faithful senders of missionaries. You want to, you want to give and pray sacrificially. You, you should go on a short-term mission trip. You should be a faithful evangelist. You should learn to share your faith effectively and clearly. If, you, if you're like, you know what, I, I would love to do that. And this retreat wasn't about, hey, so here's the five ways that you start a gospel conversation. That's not the point of this retreat. The point of this retreat is to light a fire under you to be excited about these things. But if you're like, hey, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to share the gospel. Well, then talk to someone who does. Talk to your small group leader. Talk to a friend. That says, and just say, how do you do that? How, how do you go about it? Be, be ready to share your testimony to anybody who asks you. So what does it mean to you that you're a Christian? How did you become a Christian? Be ready to share your testimony in Romans. Like, well, I need two weeks to write it down real quick and run it by my small group leader and see if everything's correct. Like, no, you, you should be ready. Let me tell you how Christ saved me. Let me tell you how Christ saved my life. And let me tell you what it means. And, and, and as you give your testimony, you make the gospel so clear. Like you say, well, yeah, you know, I, I was at church one time. And then the preacher said, God made me and I'm a sinner and Jesus Christ died for my sins. I mean, when you tell your testimony, make the gospel clear and explicit. Your testimony is one of your best evangelistic tools. So have that ready at a moment's notice. Look for and pray for opportunities to share Christ. Yes, you and I want to be obedient, right? You and I want to be obedient to the Great Commission, but that's not ultimate. Yes, you and I want to have compassion on the lost, but that's not ultimate. What is ultimate? What is ultimate is the glory of God. The glory of God is ultimate because God deserves to be praised by every single soul. Because Jesus Christ deserves the praise of every single soul because of his death on the cross. There was a man named Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. No joke. Say Zinzendorf with me. Zinzendorf. Yeah, awesome name. He was a German guy, and he was born in the 17, in 1700, and, and he founded a community of radical, sincere Christians, and this community was called Hernhut, or the Lord's Watch. And it became part of the Moravian Church, and the Moravian Church was, was known for its evangelistic and missionary zeal. After Zinzendorf had finished uh, college, he took a trip through Europe, looking at some of the cultural uh, high spots, and, and in a museum... He saw the painting by Domenico Fetti called, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Ecce Homo, Behold the Man. Okay, that's what I mean. Behold the Man. It was, a, it was a portrait of Christ with the crown of thorns pressed into his head and blood running down his face. And, and beneath the portrait were the words, I have done this for you. What have you done for me? And Zinzendorf would say that this was a life-changing moment for him. And he said to himself, I have loved him for a long time, but I have never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to. And for the rest of his life, the blood of Jesus had a central place in his thinking and in his, in his life. And, and Zinzendorf uh, made this at the center of his community at Hernhut and later the Moravian Church. And the story goes like this, that when two of the first missionaries were sent out by this Moravian Church... These two individuals had sold themselves into slavery, I believe was the story. And, and, and they sold themselves into slavery in the West Indies. And as they boarded the ship to go, oh, I might be mixing up two stories. I can't remember if they're sold in slavery or not. Scratch that. Two people go on missions to the West Indies. First one from the Moravian Church. Perhaps never to return again. 20 of the first 29 missionaries to St. Thomas and St. Croix died in those first years. 20 out of 29 died. As they got on that boat... They lifted their hands and called out to their friends on the shore. May the lamb receive 
May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. GOC, our Savior, Jesus Christ, was slain on the cross. And he didn't do it for no purpose. He did it to save you. And he did it to save not just you and me, but to save people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation for the glory of God. So let that be our heart's cry. That the glory of God would be ultimate. And so that we would say, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Let's pray.